It's a mailbag episode. Can Anthony Simons win MIP? Can Damon Ant coexist? And will the Blazers continue their egalitarian style of play when their superstar is back on the court? We're going to lock down Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazer reporter, Mike Richmond, listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making Locked On Blazers your first listen every single day. It's available on all platforms, five days a week, coming at you every single weekday, the only daily Trailblazers podcast. So make it your first listen every single day, make it a part of your daily routine, and then tell your pals to do the same. Today's episode is a mailbag episode. We usually do these each and every week. We have admittedly missed the last couple of weeks uh, because the days I had penciled in for mailbag, the Blazers made franchise altering trades and we had to pivot a little bit. But typically we do this each and every week, answering listeners submitted questions all episode long. There are two ways to get involved. You want to get involved in a future mailbag, which will be back as, on a, as a weekly a weekly standing feature here. You can tweet at me, at Mike G. Rich. Uh, just send me a tweet and everything and it help us if you indicate that it's for mailbag and for the show in some way. Or you can watch my Twitter feed, and on a day of the show, I will send out a tweet soliciting questions. You respond to that show, I will get you in the program one way or another. If you're not a Twitter user, you can tweet, you you can send me an email. LockedOnBlazersPod at gmail.com is the address. That's LockedOnBlazersPod at gmail.com. If that information went too fast, it's right down there in the episode description. You can go check it out. So, like I said, we do this each and every week. It's a ton of fun. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays mailbag from your ears. So without further ado, let's get into it. Our first question comes from Kevin. Kevin asks, I was wondering if you think Anthony Simons, Ant, as, as Kevin says, I was wondering if you think Ant has a chance at most improved pl- the most improved player award this year. If not, who are your front runners? So uh, this comes on the heels of last night. Anthony Simons had back-to-back 30-point games for the first uh, for the first time in his career. And he had 29 in the previous game. He's had three straight games of 29, 31, and 30. It's balling. And the uh, Trailblazer social media channels, after he had another fantastic game against the Bucks, tweeted out, we're starting the campaign Ant for MIP, or something along those lines. And quite frankly, legit. No, <laughs> no qualms. Um, it's... He's been really good. He is. He he said this is kind of an arbitrary thing, but last night he he set the record for most three pointers made in your first thirty starts in NBA history. Obviously, that's only going to be recent guys because back in the day, your first thirty starts, you weren't jacking up, you know, whatever seven seven threes a game and making one hundred and fourteen of them or one hundred and thirteen of them, whatever Ant made. Regardless of of the arbitrariness of that stat or uh, the Blazers getting on the MIP campaign on uh, Valentine's Day, many, many moons into the season, or at least four moons into the season, uh, he's, Amphrey Simons is a legit candidate. He's a legit person to have on your ballot. I I don't, I I don't think you could make an argument that he doesn't belong on the ballot. Uh, He's just been, he's really taken off. He started really slow and he hasn't, and he started really slow because of opportunity. Uh, he came out of the gates incredibly hot. His first nine games, he was really, really good. It was like, oh, every time might be too good. Then he had a really rough December, as the Blazers had a really rough December, but Ant had a really, really rough shooting December. And then he just took off in January. And now he's like, if, if Ant has 25 and four, I'm not going to talk about it on the podcast. Like, he's that good. I, it's like, oh, yeah, 25 and four. Yeah, it's just like a day at the office. And, and, and that sort of day at the office stuff is maybe the real testament to his most improved player campaign. He's been so good. He's taken a huge leap. Statistically, he's taken a huge leap, but a lot of those statistical leaps are due to uh, opportunity. Like he's just the back half of the year, he's just going to play so many more minutes. So his, his per game average is going to go up. It's a weird way to um, compare, but then he didn't have that opportunity early in the season. So like his, since January 1st, his numbers are like, very good starter level, borderline all-star level uh, numbers. But then there's, you know, the first two and a half months of the season. It's, you have to, you have to balance all of it. And for my money, while I think Ant belongs on the ballot, 
Uh, I think if, if you get, if like typical MBA awards, I believe you get five, but I think for MIP, you get three. I, I never had an MIP ballot, uh, but say there's five, like the MVP, uh, you know, with your ranked choice. I, I think John Morant is, is like pretty much going to win this award. He's taken the jump from being a pretty darn good player to, you know, arguably the second best point guard in the NBA, arguably the best point guard in the NBA. I don't think, I don't think that, but I think like you could make an argument. He's been over the last six weeks, he's been better than Steph Curry. Uh, he's really, really good. Memphis could find themselves in second place in the West and Ja is leading that charge. Uh, he's not, you know, Ja's not going to win MVP. He's, not, he's probably going to get, maybe he'll get a handful of votes for MVP in there, but he's, MIP was made for someone like Ja a young star who takes the leap from good to great, from pretty good to first time all-star. Back in the day, the award was like for the Hito Turkaloos of the world, where it was like, hey, you weren't good. And then you got, you had your best season at age 29. You're the, you're, you're MIP. Um, it's kind of morphed into more of the, uh, you took a big statistical jump or you are a first time all-star type of type of jump. But Kevin Love won it when he was a first time all-star type of thing. CJ McCollum took it when he took won it when he took the big statistical jump and just got got a bunch more minutes and was really efficient, about the same level of efficient, but playing, you know, 30 minutes a night. So I think it's Jaws Jaws to win. I don't think you could make a case that every time it's been better than John Morant. It's been awesome. And it's been awesome, but I don't think you make a case if he's better than John Morant. I think even in that same vein, like I think Jaron Jackson Jr. has probably a better claim to it than Anthony Simons just for like full body work. I even think you can make a case Desmond Bain, that's all three guys in Memphis I've named, you'll note, uh, has has a claim to it. Desmond Bain isn't for me. Like I, I don't, I wouldn't vote for a second year guy getting better, but he's been great. And one of the reasons the Grizzlies are so good is because a guy who was kind of good is great. Desmond Bain, Desmond Bain becoming just straight up a very, very good player is uh, maybe without the John Morant. If John Morant wasn't in the conversation, I think Desmond Bain would be leading the award. And if maybe if some people think that Morant is kind of like, I don't know, leveled up out of the space where you give him MIP, I, Desmond Bain has, has a stronger, has a strong case. I, I think if you're just ranking the Grizzlies, Ja, Desmond, uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. Then I think you got to think about Miles Bridges and Charlotte, who's been really good and taken a big leap this year and, and had, you know, just more consistent goodness, more consistent effectiveness than, than Ambry Simons has. And then DeJounte Murray in, in San Antonio, where he's just, he's taken a leap to an all-star. I think here's the thing, like all five of those guys are deserving. I think you could make up a case maybe that Ant deserves it more than Jaron Jackson Jr., but defense is is a valuable part of the game. And Jaron Jackson Jr. has taken such a leap on defense to be one of the guys who could be an all, all defense team. And I think that really matters. If Ambrose Simons is sixth on the ballot and doesn't make your ballot, if he's sixth on the list, it doesn't really take away from him for me. Uh, I think you could have a really good season that doesn't get rewarded. Really good season that you don't end up at the end, end of season award ceremony. You don't need a plaque. Um, I think we can all appreciate how friggin' good Ant has been and celebrate how friggin' good Ant has been and look to a really bright future and a handsome payday in between that really bright future for Anthony Simons. Like things are things are looking up for Ant, but I don't think he's going to win MIP. And I don't think he's he might not even be on a lot of people's ballots for, for most improved player. And I don't think that's a crime. I think it's just he took off in the middle of the season. We don't have an award for what he's doing. You know what we have we do for that? We give him $80 million every time he's going to be rewarded at the bank. So you got to be happy for Ants, but I don't think any awards are coming. All right, let's come back in the second segment, answer another question from a listener on this glorious special delivery mailbag. But first, let me tell you about prize picks. It's daily fantasy made easy. If you're looking for a daily fantasy option for the NBA, try the award-winning app Prize Picks or visit prizepicks.com. I've used Prize Picks, I really like it and I think you will like it too. It's super easy to use. You just pick between 2 and 5 players and you're picking an over under on their projections. You can win up to 10 times on any entry and it's just you versus those projected numbers. And those projected numbers are going to be over under lines on points, on rebounds, on assists, on total fantasy points, on three-pointers made, on steals, on blocks. It's super simple. You can make your Pick your entries in about 60 seconds, and then withdrawals are fast and easy too. So check out the app that's available in the App Store or on Google Play, or head on over to their website, prizepicks.com. And for a limited time, PrizePix has an exclusive no-brainer offer for all of its new users. You can get $50 for free if a player in your first PrizePix entry scores a single point, but you got to use the promo code NBA. That's right. 
Exclusive offer only available to Locked On listeners. Sign up today at pricepix.com or on their app. And while you're signing up, use the promo code NBA for $50. If a player on your first prize picks entry scores a single point, pick Anthony Simons. He's going to score one point. He's going to win you some money. That's prize picks, daily fantasy made easy. All right. Let's keep it rolling on this glorious mailbag Monday. Our next question comes from Scott PTB30, excuse me, at Scott PTB30 on Twitter. Listener Scott. Scott asks, the Dame CJ versus Dame Ant combo is inevitable. The main difference I see is Ant could be the hub of a top 10 offense. CJ was a great scorer, but I never once thought he could be that. Now, if Ant is that, I still don't know what to make of Dame and Ant. I think this gets to a lot of people ask something similar up to this question. And I think what we're getting here is like you watch Anthony Simons play. He clearly is awesome. But you, when you watch CJ McCollum play for the last nine years, he was clearly great too. And the problem wasn't CJ's skills. It was his skill set and size next to Damian Lillard. They didn't complement each other because they were too similar. That doesn't mean the Blazers weren't good. The, hell, I mean, the West Conference Finals with that group, um, with that duo being very good. Um, check the stats against OKC. That, that group lit them up. And even when Dame was worse against Denver in the second series, CJ was fantastic. And having another guy who could go score on his own and score in isolation was really valuable against those two matchups. The problem was when they met teams with length and they met teams that demanded a little more defensive intensity at the two spot, they didn't have it because they had to play guys who were going to be smaller at those spots and going to be, you know, CJ, I think, took more steps forward on defense than Dame, quite frankly. But um, neither of them were locked down defenders. You're talking about, oh, this passable def- this passable defender passable is not great you want you want like good actually good outstanding would be actually i think what you're aiming for so when you might watch ant you might say you know he might be better than cj but aren't we running into the same problem and i think yes like i think i've been i think i've been i've made my case on this in the past and i want to be consistent with my um how i feel about this i'm comfortable being inconsistent, but mostly I like to be honest about why my opinion has changed. My opinion hasn't really changed. I think Damon Ant could be an awesome pairing. Uh, I think every time is a better passer than CJ was. I think Damon Lillard figuring out as he gets older, how to play more off the ball or how to let other guys kind of take control as Dame seeds some of the control. We haven't seen him do that, but maybe there's some hope that 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 comes and ants just ants ceiling is probably higher than CJ's ceiling because Simon's is like, you know, he's 22 and just scratching the surface of like maybe being awesome to the point of like, you know, it's unlikely, but you know, like multi-time all-star awesome. Like he, you can see him touch those heights. He's really good. Um, hard to make an all-star team. So I don't want to bet on it, but like, yeah, he's really good. So the argument for, for the Damon Ant pairing being a better version of the Damon CJ pairing is, is kind of what Scott touched on is that Ant's offensive, uh, his offensive variety is a little bit different from CJ's his, his, he's started to show us earlier in his career, a better ability to read the floor and make decisions and get other guys involved. He's just a better playmaker than CJ was at this stage. He's probably a better playmaker now than CJ is at 30. Like he's um, he's, he's passed him and, and maybe lapped him in that um, in that area. Although when CJ was tasked with like just straight up playing point guard, very brief, briefly, a couple seasons ago in 2018, he was good at it. It was a 10 game stretch. Wasn't kind of like what Ant is doing, but CJ has it in him. I think it's somewhere hidden in there. It's just, he didn't, he doesn't tap into it because it's not his comfort zone. Ant might be developing a comfort zone as a playmaker. And the other argument here, and I, I think this is the one I hear most commonly and I, I maybe don't agree with, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk through it because you, you deserve it. Dear listener. Um, is it Anthony Simon's athleticism will allow his defensive peak to be much higher than CJ McCollum's? And I think there's some truth to that. Um, bigger frame, be, just like a straight up better athlete all the way around, could add some strength, could add more lateral quickness than CJ. Um, at just longer arms could be a better, could just could just straight up be a better defensive player. I know that there were some statistics floating around. I know that my good folks at B-Ball Impact had a statistic that Ant was one of the better pick and roll defenders in the NBA this year or, or over the last recent stretch of the last couple of weeks. I, I don't see that. Not with not that is not what my eyeball my eyeballs see. I see Ant as a guy who struggles on defense still. Uh, straight line drives occasionally, getting caught up in screens occasionally. I see a guy struggling a little bit, still 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 figuring out on that end. 
he's not like horrific. He's he was horrific. Let me keep it a, a, a million percent. Two years ago, Anthony Simons was one of the worst defensive players in the league. He's taken a lot of strides since then. He's gotten stronger. He's gotten more attentive on that end. He's gotten uh, just more competitive on the defensive side of the ball. There is reason to believe that his graph is going up and he can get better on, continue to get better on defense. And I see that a little bit. I do. I, I honest, honestly do. I see him. Um, I think he will continue to improve on defense. Will he improve enough on defense to be the complement that the Blazers need next to Dame? I don't know. And I'm skeptical. I think we've seen... I think we've seen the blueprint for how do you take a six foot three scoring point guard and build a a championship team. And it's everyone else who plays is six, six and above. Clay Thompson was six, seven. Andre Godala was six, six. Harrison Barnes was six, eight. Uh, What's his face? Draymond Green was six, six. When they went big, they had Andrew Bogut. Then they added six, 10 Kevin Durant to the mix. They were just Kevin Durant might even be seven feet tall. 611 plus, uh, we'll call them. Like, I think that's the actual blueprint is that if you are going to build a dominant force around a six foot three guard who can really score and scare people, that everyone else has to be gigantic. And the Warriors' secret was when they went small, quote unquote, they were huge. That was the trick. And the Blazers don't, you know, they're maybe building towards something like that with some of the players they've picked up. But if Ant and Dame is the is the build. Is, is the duo. And I think you, that can be a really awesome duo. I think there's a cap on what that can be just because, you know, defensive Dame is a bat has been a bad defensive player. He was really bad this season, like really bad. I'm going to chalk some of that up to injury, but it's never like Dame's been an above average defender. He has had moments where he looks like he's capable of it, but for the most part, he's been a below average to bad defender in the NBA. You that's fine. He is one of the best offensive players in the league at his peak. Like a bad, a bad defender who is the uh, top five offensive power. Great. You can build around that offense is more valuable than defense. So the question is, does Ant check that box for me? No, but I do think you can build a very, very competitive team with, with Ant and Dame. Do I think that that is a, the beginning of a championship duo? Probably not. Unless you get, you really nail it with the rest of the sort of complementary parts around them. I think it has a chance to be better than the Dame and CJ pairing. I think that group could be better. It's a small window because, you know, Dame is older. He's going to be 32 probably the next time him and him and Ant take the floor. But I think you have a couple years of a chance to be a really, really special backcourt duo, but I do think, as Scott notes, that it conjures up a lot of the same issues that we saw with Damon CJ. And I think it's fine to say, not ideal, but a whole bunch of talent. Let's figure it out. Like, and I think that's what the Blazers are doing. You want to accrue, you want to accumulate as much talent as possible. It would be the best way to build a team is a team that fits perfectly together with a whole bunch of talent. Golden State Warriors for three seasons, right? Perfect fit. Two of the best players in the league. Your fourth best player is a Hall of Famer. Shout out to Draymond. Uh, it's like, yeah, but most teams don't get to do that. They're choosing between fit and uh, they're choosing between f- fit and talent. And the Blazers right now have their talent happens to be two guards, so they will figure out fit later. And that's what the task is for them this summer. I think that I think this Damon Ant has enough talent to be really, really good. And the fit is remains to be seen with what the rest of the roster, what happens with the rest of the roster. All right, let's come back in the third segment, answer more of your questions with glorious mailbag Monday, but it's not even Monday, special delivery mailbag. It's Tuesday evening. But first, let's talk about betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Whatever that action is, football season's done, but basketball rolls on. Uh, you still got a couple weeks left or a week left, roughly, of the Winter Olympics. You've got the NHL's regular season. You've got uh, tennis tournaments all over the world. You've got soccer rolling on all over the globe. You've got combat sports. Whatever it is, you'll find more lines, more odds, and more props at betonline.net. So don't wait. Start getting in on the action today. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Today's show is also brought to you by Gresham Family Law. When you're faced with a big decision that could affect your family and your future, remember that you don't have to face it alone. Gresham Family Law has your back. From helping you to prepare for a successful marriage, to protecting your home, to preserving your legacy and ensuring that your last wishes are honored with respect, Gresham Family Law is proud to provide holistic family law representation and counsel in areas of family law, including divorce, custody, probate of wills, estate planning, and bankruptcy. So call Gresham Family Law right now at 503- 
465-9900 to set up an in-person consultation at their location at 1217 Northeast Burnside Road in Gresham or a socially distanced consultation via Zoom or over the phone. Plus, home visits are available for certain clients and certain case types. Visit GreshamFamilyLaw.com for more information. Still a Passford point guard. Still Mike Richmond. Still listening to Locked on Blazers. We're still rolling through a glorious special delivery mailbag. This next question comes from a couple folks. J. Glenn Gary at J. Glenn Gary on Twitter and Blazers Block at Blazers Block on Twitter and a couple other people. This was, quite frankly, all this question or this line of questioning surprised me a little bit. But if several people are curious about it, let's talk about it. J. Glenn Gary asks, this winning Blazer basketball we've seen lately has been largely due to ball movement should we be concerned about dame coming back and stagnating this beautiful team inclusive offense blazer block asks is it possible the team's offensive attack takes a step back when dame returns it's a very different attack than when he last played and it'll be interesting to see if the ball movement continues to this degree everyone is worried about damian lillard passing the ball in a way that frankly i did not see coming this The NBA, I'm getting a little caught up here. The NBA is a talent league. You want talent. The Blazers, they want Dame at his peak on the floor. And I'm not suggesting that you all think, you, dear listeners, think that they don't want Dame or that 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 calculation has changed. But like, to me, talent first and then worry about the aesthetics. But I've got some numbers for you because part of me wonders is, does the ball going in make us think the Blazers are passing more? And some of it, I feel like, because you don't remember the passes that lead to bricks. I, I think that's, that's, that's my theory here. But there is some truth that the Blazers recently have been passing more, but it's maybe not as drastic as you would think. Prior to games played on December, prior to the turn of the new year, so from all games from start of the season until December 31st, 2021, the Blazers ranked, that was 35 total games. The Blazers, Blazers averaged 22 and a half assists per game and 43.8 potential assists per game and 273 total passes per game. All of those were 23rd in the league. They were a bottom seven team in the league in assists, in potential assists, and total passes. Since December 31st, Damian Lord has not played in 2022. The kind of roster uh, was turned over to, to Anthony Simons, and he's looked like a straight-up MIP candidate. Um, Low-level all-star, like a really good player since in 2022, since the calendar turned. And since the calendar has turned, the Blazers are up from 22.5 assists to 23.3 assists which ranks 25th in the league since since January 1st. They are way up, though, or at least up significantly in potential assists, 48.8. That's five more potential assists per game in 2022 than they're averaging in 2021, and seven more total passes a game, up from, up from 273 to 280. So there is some truth. They are passing it a little bit more, and I think the potential assist speaks more because total assists – Ball go in, right? Like if you, it's it, um, they're averaging barely more assists because they have less talent on the court, and so you're just not going to make as many shots. But I think the the jump in potential assists by five a game is a notable number, a notable number. And over the last four games, that's since CJ McCollum has been up out of here. CJ McCollum, a noted ball stopper, very good player, but noted ball stopper. The Blazers are averaging twenty six and a half assists a game and fifty five potential assists. That's second over that span over the last four games. That's a big old jump. And I think that's the, that is the real truth. I was ready to say, hey, the numbers say that it's not even like that. Because I, I, I agree with you, dear listeners, um, Blazers Block and, and Jay Glenn, that like it's, it looks like the ball is moving more. And the numbers suggest the ball is moving more too. But I, I sometimes think our, eyeball, our eyeballs um, and, and the sort of numbers don't always align. In this case, they do align absolutely true so uh first of all good catch second of all like this is some of the truth of the ball moving more is because of who you have on the court which is the concern over damian lillard returning so i have two thoughts on this one i think Dame and CJ made the ball move a little bit less because Dame would kick it to CJ and CJ would dance, 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 shoot. Um, And Dame isn't a great off ball mover. And when early in the season, they tried to take Dame off the ball and run actions for him. And he just wasn't good at it. He prefers to be on the ball and run pick and rolls and run actions, screen, rescreen, pound the rock, get his shots up and make reads from there. It does. It's not that Dame doesn't pass. It's that he wants to go about it a certain way. So possessions, 
tend to evolve or devolve into what he wants to do, which is run a high pick and roll or want to run a empty side pick and roll and pick apart defenses. He's capable of moving the ball. It's just the ball isn't going to spring around and find him again. He's not Steph Curry. It's like there's going to be a singular pass. And in fact, the way the league is going, less passes is a relatively common trend. But the Blazers have looked better when the ball moves more. And I think that is personnel. Um, just like re in, in the four, four games, like post CJ, like, Justice Winslow can really pass and is, is capable of doing it. Uh, Josh Hart, way, way, way better passer than Norman Powell was. Norman Powell doesn't really believe in passing. I love that about his game. It's one of the things I really appreciate about his game. He sees three dudes between him and the rim and he says, gotcha. Uh, <laughs> this is an opportunity for me, but he doesn't pass much. You sub those guys out for a Josh Hart and a, and a Justice Winslow. You sub, uh, you know, you play more of CJ Ellaby in, in Nazir Little's minutes. Nazir Little, really good offensive player, but um, and and had developed as a passer for sure. But CJ Ellaby has like real passing chops. He can read the court. Um, he's a better, you know, better, not as nearly as good a basketball player, but a better, just like sort of raw court vision passer than than Nazir Little is. Like you're just putting better players in that position. I think. Um, the way that they've run the offense through Nurk, he's been a little bit more eager to pass the ball than he had been early in the season. So why I'm sort of going through personnel is because the answer to your question is unknowable. I do not know if the Blazers will be better or uh, or can sustain the style with Dame and Lord. But I know this, the Blazers have not have been a low assist team with Dame on the court and the players matter. And I think this is important to note. This is not necessarily a coaching thing. Chauncey Billups would love to play this way. Dame and Lord wouldn't. When you're on the court, you're kind of melding the wishes of those two people. And Dame is the one who's playing and dribbling. He can make the decisions more clearly. Um, or at least make the ultimate decisions, I guess, is maybe a better way to say that. So, I think the Blazers can move the ball more. And I think Damian Lord can watch the ball move a little bit more and say, Hey, this, this is better for us. But some reason that the ball moves more is lack of talent straight up. When you have the ball needs to move more to take advantage of what you have. When you have great individual scores like Dame, you don't need to pass as much because you can get similar quality looks with fewer passes there is a trade-off and there is probably a happy medium the Blazers can reach, but I am in favor of injecting, and I'm sure you are too, injecting more talent into it and then figuring out from there. I'm skeptical that the Blazers will be, you know, second in the league in, uh, in potential assists next year with Dame on the court because of his preferred style of, of basketball. But that doesn't mean that they won't be really good. And it doesn't mean that they won't, with other lineups, move the ball a little bit more. The point is finding a balance. And I think Damon Lord is smart enough and has watched this team enough to find a balance. And I think after a year in Chauncey Billups' system, a system that quite frankly has evolved dramatically from the beginning of the season to, um, to what it is now, then they can get there. I do not think they're ever going to be a high assist, high pass team with Damian Lillard on the court, but they've been a really elite offense with Damian Lillard on the court. And sometimes you just have to take the style of what your best player does and fit the parts around it. The same thing with the Ant and Dame pairing in the backcourt is the sort of style of offense you, that your best player wants to play. What parts complement that? And I think Anthony Simons with his, his spot up shooting ability and his playmaking ability can complement that a little bit better. I think with, Winslow and Hart and, and, and Nurk's passing chops and whoever they might add in the off season to this mix. Like you add more ball movers, you're going to get more ball movement. You play a lot of minutes with Norm and CJ on the court. You know what time it is. Also like the previous iterations of this roster with Ennis Cantor and Gary Trent Jr. And Carmelo Anthony, just a bunch of dudes who do not want to pass. You add more dudes who want to pass. I think you can get back there. We did not see it at the beginning of the season, but I think there's reason to believe the Blazers can take steps in the right direction, although they might not solve the riddle completely. The, the true answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I know which way I'm leaning is they're going to pass less when Dame's back because it's what he's comfortable with. But the true answer to your question is, we'll see. And I'm excited to see what that looks like because the way the Blazers have been playing over the last week has got me excited to what's next with this team. They have a path back. To, they seem to have a pretty clear path back to being competitive, uh, you know, a floor of being mediocre and maybe something much more than that. And they've got some young, intriguing parts and some, some veteran parts that I think can help them answer some of the questions with the playmaking and the defense that maybe they couldn't answer in the past. So I'm excited to see what's next. And Dame's inclusion and Ant's growth are what is next for this group. That is going to do it for this episode. If you want to get involved in a future mailbag, 
at Mike T. Rich on Twitter or LockedOnBlazersPod at gmail.com. All of that info in the episode description for this very episode. Tell your friends about the show. Tell them to find us wherever they get podcasts. Five days a week, free on every single platform. Make it your first listen every day. Make it a part of daily routine and tell your pals to do the same. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.